Hi, my name is Jeremy Smith. I'm a physician assistant at Stubman Hawkins Clinic and I work with Dr. Gennario. Uh, today we're going to talk about hip arthroscopy, labral tears, and hip impingement. Femoral acetabular impingement and labral tears. So we're going to start out talking about. So first we're going to review some anatomy on labral tears in the labrum. If we look at first the picture here on the left, you can see the labrum is a gasket seal cartilage that goes around the socket. And at the top of the socket, you can see some red irritated labral tissue and some of it is peeled off the rim of the socket. If we look at the picture on the right where the silver probe is, you can see some shredded labral tissue in this arthroscopic picture. As we continue to review anatomy, there's something called cam and pincer abnormalities. And you can take a look at the pictures here of how on the left hand side you can see the cam bump is a bump on the femoral neck and the pincer abnormality is a bone spur on the rim of the socket and if we look at the picture on the right you can see another way that those are presented and those areas can collide together and tear the labrum over time. Another reason sometimes patients develop labral tears over time is something called hip dysplasia. If we take a look at the picture here on the left hand side, you can see normal coverage of the socket over the femoral head. If we look at the picture on the right, you can see the socket's very shallow and most of the bone does not cover the top of the femoral head and that's called hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is something that can cause labral tears. Another thing that can cause labral tears is hip instability where there's just some subtle uh, loss of coverage of the socket over the femoral head that causes some instability where the ball moves excessively within the socket and causes a labral tear over time. We take a look at both of these issues when we look at hip arthroscopy as they can cause labral tears and we wanna make sure we address the appropriate uh, bony coverage and in addition, repair the labrum. By addressing the bony coverage, that can help prevent a repeat labral tear down the road. So next we're gonna talk about femoral acetabular impingement treatment First, uh, we always look at physical therapy as a mainstay of treatment, uh, working on gluteal strength, core strength, and stretching out the anterior chain muscles, such as the hip flexor. Additionally, we can look at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as ibuprofen, Aleve, or prescription varieties of those medications. Typically, this is a short-term treatment and not a long-term treatment. Cortisone injection is another thing we can look at for conservative treatment. Typically with cortisone injections, when you look at big studies, they work temporarily, but then wear off over time. And lastly, we look at surgery options, which could be hip arthroscopy versus hip replacement. For patients that have significant arthritis, they're better to have a hip replacement. For any of the patients we're considering hip arthroscopy with, they typically have a labral tear, but no significant arthritis. So what exactly is hip arthroscopy uh, and what's some terminology involved with it? Well, one thing is femoral plasty where we're removing the cam abnormality or the bony abnormality on the femoral neck. Acetabular plasty is removing the pincer abnormality on the rim of the socket or the bone spur on the rim of the socket. And then we look at labral repairs versus labral reconstruction. A labral repair would be repairing your own tissue versus the reconstruction would be using an IT band cadaver graft to replace a portion of the labrum that was too shredded and not repairable. That is typically an interoperative decision on whether or not to do a labral reconstruction, but occasionally we can tell on the MRI whether or not that's necessary. Capsulography is a reference to closing the capsular tissue that surrounds the ball and socket. And sometimes we need to tighten this capsular tissue uh, for some of the patients have some mild instability. The soft tissue constraint can help uh, prevent some of that instability and help prevent a re-tear in the labrum. And the next thing we look at is microfracture. So what is microfracture exactly? Microfracture is for a patient that has a small section of arthritis in their hip where we can use an arthroscopic pick to put some small poke holes in the bone and then that bone can bleed and also we can use some of the stem cells through those poke holes to create a super clot that over time can create some fibrous cartilage to protect that area where some arthritis had initially developed. 
Ultimately, this can help out some with some of the arthritis pain. This is also typically an interoperative decision. So let's talk about the surgery itself and how that day looks. Typically, a patient will show up about two hours before the surgery to the surgery center and get started with the nursing team. The nurses will put an IV in and get you all ready for surgery. Then you'll see the anesthesiologist who will talk to you about doing a general anesthetic without a nerve block. Typically, we don't do a nerve block because there's been some high incidence of post-operative falls due to the nerve block affecting your motor strength for the first 24 hours after surgery. After you talk to the anesthesiologist about all the risks and benefits of the anesthesia, Dr. Gennari will come by and answer any last minute questions you have, and then he will initial the operative side. Then we'll head back to the surgery room, and that surgery is done through two or three small portal incisions. They're about a centimeter and a half in size. We're all through an arthroscopic camera able to do the surgery and it takes about two to three hours to shave down any bone spurs, repair the labrum, and close any capsule or tissue. Following the surgery, you'll be taken to the post anesthesia care unit or PACU where you'll be monitored, make sure you're comfortable, make sure you're able to eat and drink something, and then typically this is an outpatient surgery where the patient will go home a couple hours after the surgery. If somehow there's an issue where you're uncomfortable or you're having trouble with eating or drinking due to nausea, then there's an option to stay in the surgery center for 23 hour observation and go home the next morning. So what are the risks involved with surgery? Well, there's small risk of infection anytime you have surgery, although it's very rare and certainly less than 1%. Small risk of bleeding complications, although we haven't had those. Uh, small risk of a nerve injury where there's some sensory nerves that can be affected by traction with the surgery and with the incisions. This can sometimes cause some numbness into the thigh and groin. Sometimes this numbness can also involve the top of the foot. Most of the time this resolves over a period of time, but occasionally patients have some persistent numbness surrounding the incisions. Another thing we worry about, especially with living in altitude, is the potential risk for blood clots. We use aspirin for two weeks after surgery, along with TEDHOs and compression devices to help protect from this. Overall, though, blood clots are still very rare. Another thing we worry about that's a very rare issue, and it's typically case reported, is avascular necrosis. This can be where you lose some blood supply to the hip joint uh, related to the surgery, and the bone could start to die over time. We use x-rays to monitor and make sure this is not an issue as we take those x-rays post-operatively, and we haven't ever had any case of avascular necrosis. Another thing we think about is hydrotopic ossification. This is where you develop some bone formation surrounding the hip joint. This is very rare overall, and we try to protect from that by using an anti-inflammatory for 30 days following surgery. Other rare risks include anesthesia complication, which the anesthesiologist will discuss with you, femoral neck fracture, which is rare, but we do use crutches for three weeks after surgery to protect from this issue, and hip dislocation, which is another rare potential complication, although we haven't ever had one of those issues. What about the outcomes from surgery? Well, preoperatively, patients typically report their hip score in the 50s or 60s out of 100. This is developed by a standardized hip outcome scoring system, and that's typically described as a D or F hip. Postoperatively, with a reassessment with a standardized outcome scoring system, Typically, it's an 85 to 88 or a B-plus hip. So not a perfect hip, but much better. What about post-operative medications? Uh, well, as long as you're not allergic, uh, we use aspirin, 325 milligrams per day for a couple weeks to protect for blood clots. We use naproxen for 30 days to help protect from that bone formation. We use Prilosec to help protect your stomach for 30 days to help uh, keep from your stomach being irritated related to taking the aspirin and naproxen. 
use an antibiotic, keflex or clindamycin for a day after surgery to help protect from infection. And we also use IV antibiotics surrounding surgery. Norco is your mainstay post-operative pain medicine. And it's a narcotic, which typically most patients just use for a few days, but they're certainly off that medicine by 10 days out from surgery. Valium is a post-operative narcotic that helps with spasm, pain, and sleep. This is typically also just used for a few days. Zofran helps protect from nausea related to medications or anesthesia. And Losartan, most patients will be prescribed to help protect from scarring following the surgery. All right, let's talk about post-operative rehab plan. So following surgery, we get started uh, with physical therapy right away. That starts the day after surgery. Additionally, we either set you up with a CPM machine that helps move your hip back and forth for six to eight hours a day to protect from scarring. Or if you have an exercise bike at home, you can use on low or no resistance, starting at five to 10 minutes a day and increasing to 30 minutes a day. Either of these we need to use for three weeks following the surgery starting on post-operative day number one uh, and help protect from scarring. A lot of patients ask about a swimming or biking program and that's typically directed by the physical therapist and normally starts a few weeks after surgery or even up to six weeks after surgery. Following surgery, we use head hose or compression devices and actually use both of those for two weeks to help protect from blood clots. Initially, you'll be on crutches, 50% weight bearing with a hip brace for the first three weeks. At three weeks, we discontinue the hip brace, but we'll have a transition period off of crutches, which typically takes an additional one to two weeks. You'll follow up in the office with Dr. Gennaro and myself 10 to 14 days after surgery for suture removal and also initial post-operative x-ray. At six weeks out from surgery, you'll do another follow-up in the clinic and at that point, you should be off crutches, uh, but long days of standing or walking, your hip will still be sore. At 12 weeks after surgery, we'll do another clinical recheck and also we'll do a repeat x-ray to make sure the hip joint looks good on x-ray. Typically, you'll be doing really well with daily activities by 12 weeks, and we'll start some initial strengthening program to get ready for sports. Anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks after surgery, you can start a walk-run interval program or a return to running program. At 18 weeks after surgery, we'll recheck you in the clinic, myself with Dr. Gennario, and we'll be assessing how your strength's uh, doing and also reassess your range of motion. At 24 weeks after surgery, it'll be a final follow-up with myself with Dr. Gennario, and we'll do a final x-ray. At that point, we typically, as long as all your strength is returned and you're doing well with physical therapy, we'll let you start to return to your sport. A few pearls with the surgery. Eight months after surgery is the average return to your sport. When they looked at an NFL study and a distance running study, it typically took eight months to return to the same level of your sport. Studies also show patients will continue to improve one to two years after surgery as they continue to regain some strength. And additionally, a hip arthroscopy has not been shown to prevent hip replacement, although there is some studies that show that arthroscopic surgery may help prevent arthritis. Finally, one thing to remember in regards to surgery preparation, nothing to eat or drink after midnight before your surgery, except you can have a 20 ounce Gatorade five hours before your surgery, as we use that to hydrate, as hydration has been shown to help prevent blood clots. If you have any other questions with your upcoming surgery, please reach out to myself or Dr. Gennario. We'd be glad to answer any other questions. And the rest of our team would always be glad to help out too. All right, we'll see you soon.